In this lecture presentation, we'll build upon what we began discussing in the last lecture presentation, Introduction to Reasoning. If you haven't watched that lecture yet, I recommend stopping here and viewing that lecture presentation first. As always, I also recommend having the slides nearby so that you can fill in the blanks as we proceed through the slides and to take notes on any information that is not presented on the slides. A syllogism usually has two statements that are referred to as premises and a third statement called the conclusion. Syllogistic reasoning involves deciding whether a conclusion can be properly inferred from those statements. A syllogism is considered valid if the conclusion is always true given the premises. If there is any way in which it might not be true, it is invalid. The content of syllogisms is irrelevant. All blank are blank could be filled with words, symbols, letters, pictures, it doesn't matter. Syllogistic reasoning is dramatically affected by quantifiers. Quantifiers are words that tell us how many in the category apply. For example, all, some, or none. Syllogistic reasoning reduces the likelihood of what are known as illicit conversation errors. For example, all A or B is not the same thing as all B or A. All kiwis are fruits is true, but all fruits are not kiwis. Premises and conclusions are classified according to what are known as moods. There are four moods in syllogistic reasoning. The universal affirmative is all A are B. The particular affirmative, some A are B. Universal negative, no A are B. And the particular negative, some A are not B. You can see in the picture that birds are overlapped under the major category of has wings. But you'll notice that there is a portion of the red circle has wings that is not covered by birds. What this means is that while all birds have wings, not everything with wings is a bird. Can you think of anything that has wings that is not a bird? Perhaps you came up with airplanes, fairies, butterflies, or another example. For those of you who like to pause the recording to view the videos, you might pause here to watch the video, Basics of Syllogisms. There are two primary strategies to solving syllogisms, that is, determining if the syllogism is valid or invalid. We'll discuss circle diagrams first, and we'll conclude this lecture presentation by discussing the verbal rules that can also be used to determine validity of syllogisms. Circle diagrams are a strategy for visualizing relationships among categories. Like most visualizations or representations of information, circle diagrams help alleviate the limitations of short-term and working memory and helps make relationships more obvious and more visible. The circles represent the degree of inclusion or exclusion of the categories. The degree to which circles overlap depict the inclusion or exclusion of those categories. There are a specific number of circle diagrams for each syllogistic mood. We will go through each of these on the following slides. Let's start with the universal affirmative, all A are B. Universal refers to the fact that it applies to everything in the category. That is the word all in this case. It is affirmative because it lacks the terms no or not. There are two circle diagrams that correspond with the universal affirmative. It's important to remember that we always have to represent all of the possibilities. We have to account for every way that the statement could be interpreted. So let's use the example, all angels are bald. There are two ways that that can be diagrammed. 
If you look at the left-hand circle diagram, you'll see smaller a contained within bigger b. This depicts all angels are bald and some bald things are not angels. You can see that all of a is overlapping b, so all of the angels are bald. But this allows for the possibility that while all angels are bald, there are bald things that are not angels. The circle diagram on the right shows all angels are bald and all bald things are angels. This is if the category is exactly the same, completely overlapping. There are no angels who are not bald and there are no bald things that are not angels. Moving on to the particular affirmative. Like the universal affirmative, the particular affirmative lacks the terms no and not. But unlike the universal affirmative, the particular affirmative uses the term some. Because of the particular nature, there are more circle diagrams that correspond to the particular affirmative than there are for the universal affirmative. There are four possibilities when it comes to the particular affirmative. Starting with the circle diagram top left, you'll notice this is exactly the same as the top left possibility for the universal affirmative. That is, all angels are bald, but not all bald things are angels. At top right, it's also the same as the universal affirmative. All angels are bald, and all bald things are angels. The particular affirmative has two additional circle diagrams. The bottom left circle diagram shows us that in this case, while all bald things are angels, not all angels are bald. Lastly, in the bottom right hand corner, we have a Venn diagram. This shows us that there are some angels that are not bald, some bald things that are not angels, and the overlapping portion of the circles shows us the bald angels. That is, where the circles overlap represents the angels who are bald and the bald things who are angels. Where the circles do not overlap represent the angels who are not bald and the bald things who are not angels. Next, we have the universal negative, which most people will find to be the easiest of the four moods. The universal negative includes the word no, which is why it is negative. The universal portion refers to the fact that it applies to all in the category. So no angels are bald. Because no angels are bald, there is no portion of either circle that overlaps. There are angels who are not bald and there are bald things who are not angels. The final of the four moods is the particular negative. Particular because of the term some, negative because of the term not. So the particular negative is some A are not B. Some angels are not bald. This allows for three possibilities. The first in the upper left is exactly the same as the universal negative. It accounts for the fact that it's possible that no angels are bald and no bald things are angels. Next, in the upper right, this demonstrates that there are angels who are not bald, but that all bald things are angels. Lastly, in the bottom, we have our Venn diagram. Again, this depicts that there are angels who are not bald, there are bald things that are not angels, and the overlapping portion of the Venn diagram shows us the angels who are bald slash the bald things that are angels. Before we move in to the in-class example of using circle diagrams to determine syllogistic validity, you might consider pausing the recording to view the video Solving Syllogisms. Alternatively, you might wait until after the in-class example to view the video. We are going to use the syllogism example of all people on welfare are poor, some poor people are dishonest, some people on welfare are dishonest. We will be using this syllogism for the next few slides. The steps that we will cover, 
Start with writing out the premises and the conclusions separately. Next, to identify labels and moods for each premise and conclusion. Third, to draw all of the corresponding circle diagrams for the premises and conclusions. Fourth, systematically combine each circle diagram. And lastly, to continue combining circle diagrams until either you've combined each possibility or you found a combination that does not correspond to the conclusion, in which case the syllogism is invalid and you can stop there. Step one is to write out premises and conclusions separately. Premise one, all people on welfare are poor. Premise two, some poor people are dishonest. And the conclusion, some people on welfare are dishonest. Our job is to find out if the conclusion is always true if the premises are true. That is, every combination of circle diagrams from premise one and premise two must be consistent with the circle diagrams that align with the conclusion. In step two, we'll identify the labels and the moods for each premise and conclusion. Premise one is the universal affirmative, all A are B. So A refers to people on welfare and B, poor. Premise two, the particular affirmative. Some poor people are dishonest. Some B are C. We've already determined B is poor. In this case, C is dishonest. The conclusion is also particular affirmative. Some A are C. A for welfare, C for dishonest. Now that we've identified the labels and moods, we can move into step three, which is to draw all of the circle diagrams that correspond to the various premises and the conclusion. Premise one, all people on welfare are poor, all A are B. We know from the previous slide that there are two circle diagrams that correspond with the universal affirmative. That is little a inside big B and big AB. Premise two, some poor people are dishonest, some B are C. That comes with four different possibilities of circle diagrams. Little b inside big C, big BC, little c inside big B, and the overlapping Venn diagram BC. The conclusion, some people on welfare are dishonest, some A are C. For this, we are also drawing circle diagrams that reflect the particular affirmative. In this case, we're using the variables A and C. Little a inside big C, big AC, little c inside big A, and the overlapping Venn diagram of A and C. Okay, we've made it to step four. You might be thinking, this seems pretty challenging, and you're not alone. In my experience teaching this course, this step and circle diagrams in general tend to be one of the hardest concepts of the entire course. If you're struggling with it, stick with it. It generally will click after a bit. And as always, you can reach out if you need some support. So step four involves systematically combining each of the circle diagrams. That needs to be strategized in such a way to make sure that you are looking at every possible combination of premise one and premise two and comparing each combination with the options for the conclusion. If at any point you find a combination of premise one and premise two that does not align with the conclusion, the syllogism is invalid and you can stop there. Let's see what happens when we do the in-class example together. So premise one, if you look at the previous slide, had the options of small a inside big B and big AB. I personally like to start with what I would call 1A, the first of the two options for premise one. I then combine it with the first option for premise two, which as you can see is little b inside big C. So our task here is to combine 1A with 2A. Now, 
Little a is inside big B, and little b is inside of big C. So when we combine them, it looks like little a inside bigger B inside bigger C. Now we have to ask ourselves, is that consistent with one of the options of the conclusion? If you look at the conclusion options, there is a choice for little a inside big C. So we can put a check mark next to 1a plus 2a because the conclusion of little a inside big C is consistent with the particular affirmative conclusion. Next, you could do 1a plus 2b. 1a is the same, and 2b, which is the second of the options for premise 2, is big B, big C. Now, when you combine these two together, little a is inside of BC. We know that B and BC are the same thing because they're completely overlapping. So little a goes inside of big BC. Now, this also aligns with the conclusion because again, we have little a inside of big C, which is one of our options for the conclusion. Now let's go to the next one, which is a little trickier. Here we're gonna combine the same 1a, but this time with the third option for premise two, which is little c inside of big B. Now this one's trickier because we don't know the relationship between a and c. As you can tell from the circle diagrams, we know little a is inside of big B, and we know little c is inside of big B but what is the relationship between A and C? There are three ways that this might be combined. A and C could be exactly the same, in which case it would be AC inside of B. A and C might be overlapping in a Venn diagram, or A and C might be completely separate circles within big B. Now, if you take the first example, little c inside of b, the conclusion is actually aligned with a and c being together, because that's one of the options of the conclusion. Now, in the second box, you'll see a and c as overlapping Venn diagrams. That's also one of the options of the conclusion. Unfortunately, this third option here, a and c in separate circles, is not a possibility of the particular affirmative conclusion. Therefore, at this point, we have determined that the syllogism is invalid. There is no way in which A and C can be separate circles with the conclusion some A are C. What this tells us is that no A are C. Again, because we have found a possibility that determines its invalidity, we can stop here. If this had been consistent with the conclusion, you would have moved on to 1a plus 2d, and then 1b plus 2a, 1b plus 2b, 1b plus 2c, and 1b plus 2d. If all of those had been consistent with the conclusion, you would have successfully proven that this syllogism was valid. So maybe you're thinking circle diagrams seem pretty challenging and a lot of work. And if that's you, you might really prefer the verbal rules for validity. First, you need to learn a couple of important pieces of terminology. The first is the middle term. The middle term is the term that links the premises. In the example we've been using, all people on welfare are poor, all A are B, some poor people are dishonest, some B are C, some people on welfare are dishonest, some A are C. You'll notice that the middle term is in both of the premises, but is not in the conclusion. It is what links premise one to premise two, so that the conclusion can then represent the relationship between A and C. The next term is distributed. Distributed means that the statement applies to every item in the category and it usually uses words like all, no, or not. In terms of the universal affirmative, all A are B. A is considered to be distributed and B is undistributed. 
This is because all A, the all refers to the A, but not to the B. So all kiwis can be fruit, but not all fruits are kiwis. In the particular affirmative, some A are B, both A and B are undistributed. Neither A nor B apply to every item in the category. No A or B are both distributed, and that's because there is absolutely no overlap. A is, applies to every item in that category, and B applies to every item in that category. Lastly, some A are not B. In this case, A is undistributed because it's modified by the quantifier sum. B is distributed because it is modified by the quantifier not. Now that you know the middle term and distribution, let's move on to the steps that you can take to use the verbal rules to determine validity. For a conclusion to be valid, the syllogism must pass all of the rules. If it fails at any step, it is invalid and you can stop there. We'll practice going through these verbal rules to determine syllogistic validity on the next slide. Using the class example that we've been using so far, all people on welfare are poor, some poor people are dishonest, some people on welfare are dishonest. In this case, the middle term is B, poor. It is mentioned in both premises, but not in the conclusion. Let's look at step one. If the conclusion is negative, one premise must be negative. Or if one premise is negative, the conclusion must be negative. In this case, None of the premises or the conclusion are negative, so we can check this off and move to step two. In step two, the middle term must be distributed in at least one premise. Let's go through the premises to see if this is the case. The first premise, all people on welfare are poor. The middle term is poor, and we know that for the universal affirmative, only A is distributed. So in that case, with premise one, the middle term is not distributed. The second premise, some poor people are dishonest. With the particular affirmative, neither A nor B, or in this case, B or C, are distributed. That means that this syllogism fails at step two of the verbal rules because neither of the middle terms are distributed in the premises. We already learned that it was invalid from the circle diagrams, but had we used these steps, we would have also learned it was invalid by step two. Let's try example two next. All physics students are good at math. Some freshmen are physics students. Some freshmen are good at math. In this case, with rule number one, there are again no negatives. Let's move to rule two. For step two, we have to determine if the middle term is distributed in at least one premise. Determining the middle term here is a bit more challenging. Can you figure out what the middle term is? As a reminder, the middle term is the term that is used in both of the premises, but not in the conclusion. So in this case, the middle term is A, physics students. The first statement, all physics students are good at math, all ARB, tells us that A, physics students, is distributed. Therefore, in this case, we can cross off step two. Moving to three. In step three, we are trying to determine if any term distributed in the conclusion also is distributed in at least one premise. Let's look at the conclusion. Some freshmen are good at math. Are there any terms in that conclusion that are distributed? No, therefore we can cross that step off as well. Moving on to number four. If both premises are particular, there's no valid conclusion. We know that premise one is the universal affirmative. Therefore, both premises are not particular and we can cross that one off as well. Step five, if one premise is particular, the conclusion must be particular. In this case, premise two is particular and so is the conclusion. Moving on to step six. 
In step six, we need to determine if at least one premise is affirmative. And in this case, both premises are affirmative. Lastly, step seven, two universal premises cannot have a particular conclusion. In this case, while premise one is universal, premise two is particular, and therefore we can cross this step off as well. Since we have made it through all seven steps, we can now say confidently that this syllogism is valid. Let's try our last example for this lecture presentation. Some lawyers are not smart. Some smart people are rich. Some lawyers are rich. Step one, if a conclusion is negative, one premise must be negative. In this case, you'll notice that premise one is negative. However, the conclusion is not negative. Therefore, we have failed at step one of the verbal rules and can determine that this last example is invalid.